All right. Uh, welcome to module 13. This is our first punch discussion module. So I'm going to be kind of walking through the process of that today. Um, all right. So here we go. Okay, punch discussion one, the naked kiss. Um, again, I'm going to try not to take too much time on the primer presentation, but I'm going to go through it. And at the end, if you're confident, if you paid attention last module, you know what to do. Uh, but if not, stay with me till the very end and I'll kind of go through the process one more time as well. Okay. Um, so just as a reminder, make sure you watch the entirety of this lecture video. I'm gonna go over the primer topics and offer a little bit of context for the screening today. So watch this video. Yes, take notes to inform your screening. Yes, uh, then watch the film on Canopy. The film that you're watching is The Naked Kiss. Uh, I'll say it again as we kind of keep going here. You should be registered for Canopy at this point. I mentioned this in the uh, welcome video, the module one video. You should be registered for Canopy. Um, and hopefully you know how to navigate it. That's all in the walkthrough video that I posted. Uh, but again, at the very end of this, after I finish the presentation, if you have any questions, stick around and I'll go through the process one more time. Um, then after you watch The Naked Kiss, you take notes per the primer presentation. You're going to go back and write and post your punch discussion contribution on the discussion board that's linked in this module. As a reminder, the discussion board for this film is due November 10th by 11.59 p.m. And as a reminder, your analysis paper is due December 1st by 11.59 p.m. Okay, so I'm gonna offer some context for this film. Uh, I think it's important to note, we are going to be using the feminist film theory for The Naked Kiss, but we also need to kind of put this into some perspective. The movie was released in 1964. I think I'm getting that year correct. And we kind of just need to know where we are at as a society. Um, so there's a couple of terms I want to, to define early here just so we're using correct terminology. Um, and again, especially in thinking in sort of 1964. Um, for example, you can see in my notes here in just a second, but obviously we've learned gender to be a much more um, you know, complicated term than something that's just binary. But at the time of this film, obviously you know, they weren't really there yet. They, they weren't quite as progressive, but we need to sort of just set this as a uh, foundation. So uh, the term sex. Sex is the biological sex a person was assigned at birth. It's based on biological characteristics as indicated by chromosomes, gonads, hormones, and genitals. Gender, and again, this is the idea of gender binary, um, kind of putting us into terminology for 1960s. Uh, but gender is the socially constructed characteristics of women and men, attitudes, feelings, and behaviors that a culture associates with a person's biological sex. Gender roles, these are roles that society expects women and men to fulfill. Um, the idea of a professional and personal path based on gender. Uh, gender norms are traditional gender stereotypes. Again, this film is, is challenging a lot of these stereotypes at the time. Um, so again, I'm just kind of giving us a little bit of context here, but some you know, regressive and toxic gender stereotypes uh, that were especially prominent in the 1960s and you know, many cultures still are, um, I think in America too, but we're fighting against that. Uh, but some gender norms, uh, gender stereotypes are you know, women, we have characteristics of submissive, dependent, nurturing. Men, aggressive, independent, tough. Okay. So uh, now that we kind of set that to give a little bit of information regarding the damage of gender roles and stereotypes. Uh, gender roles are often created by geography, religion, politics, and family attitudes. Everything from female depictions in film 
to toys reinforce gender roles and stereotypes. We saw this with the feminist film theory uh, video example that we saw and how you know movies like James Bond films sort of reinforce these stereotypes uh, for many generations. In America, especially pre-second wave feminism, gender roles were strictly enforced. Uh, for example, women not having the right to vote and voting suppression in order to maintain the patriarchy. Uh, patriarchy, just to define it here, is again, very much so in American culture uh, where white men hold power in these power constructs. Uh, women were told that their role was passive and narrow. Uh, America has a history of oppressing people who are not white men via social constructs, including racism, sexism, and xenophobia. Okay, so a bit of historical context for this film. Again, this was released uh, around 1964. So the idea of sort of what this film is responding to. And I wanna give a little bit of context for the women's rights movement uh, during the time of the release of this film. So again, a couple terms I wanna boil down here is feminism. Feminism is a social, economical, and political equality of the sexes. Uh, it's a movement to end the oppression of women as a group. Uh, throughout most of Western history, women were confined to the domestic sphere. Both legal and social restraints were placed on women as forms of oppression to keep men in power. First wave fem feminism occurred, uh, whoops, let me rephrase that. First wave feminism focused on legal rights, like the right to vote. This, um, this was in mostly 19th century and early 20th century. And then the women's liberation movement, uh, which was a form of second wave femi feminism, was a social movement that began in the 1960s that sought equal rights and opportunities and greater personal freedom. So now this was more so focusing on social constructs. Uh, politics work to reconsider the family role and sexuality. It was ignited by Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique, which was a book published in 1963. There were many factors, obviously, that um, propelled second wave feminism, but we're going to see how the feminine mystique sort of, again, sort of laid a foundation. I'm going to offer a little bit of information regarding that book and its impact. So Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique. This was a landmark book in 1963 that brought to light the dissatisf dissatisfaction among women in mainstream American society in post-World War II period. Um, it's also important to note that there are valid criticisms, especially that have kind of come of recent, that we kind of have some um, more context of how uh, Betty Friedan did the research for this book. So there are valid criticism, excuse me, there are valid criticisms to Friedan's work, like classism and racism. Friedan's interviewees were often white, middle to upper class, straight married women. Um, so obviously, the, her sample is very limited. It's not, necess, it's not representative. Uh, but again, the book definitely unpacked important topics. So um, what else do I have here? Also, criticisms of Frieden's work demonizing stay-at-home mothers. So I said this from the very start, especially when we got into film analysis, but always be suspect of blanket statements. But it's important to understand that the feminine mystique helped bring to light the socially systemic oppression of women and actively reconsider gender roles in America. A quote that I pulled from one of the, uh, the research that I uh, pulled for this presentation is the quote, giving language to the frustrations women felt. And that was in terms of the book's um, sort of presence and its impact. Again, the idea of um, a, a social construct is something that's a little more insidious, right? It's not something that's necessarily in the public eye, uh, but this book started to kind of expose that. Uh, so some more information with the feminine mystique, the societal assumption. Well, let me just kind of go back one step. The feminine mystique is essentially a, a term that was kind of coined by this book. And its definition is the societal assumption that women could find fulfillment through housework, marriage, sexual pass passivity, and child rearing alone. 
So if you kind of pause on that for a second, you can clearly see how um, in this era, right up to 1963, the femme mystique was breaking down and addressing gender norms that are being perpetuated in society. It's the idea of society wanting to create very sort of narrow and singular roles for women at the time. Um, further, prevailing, prevailing attitudes held that truly feminine women had no desire for higher education, careers, or a political voice. Rather, they found complete fulfillment in the domestic fear, sphere. Um, how society sees women serving a singular role in society. The, again, sort of gender stereotype here of the typical housewife, the myth of pleasant domesticity, the idea of supporting the man and not pursuing professional and or personal interests. Whoops, okay. So then uh, upon this book's publication and with the wave of second wave feminism, we started to see a, a growth of awareness, right? An awareness of systemic gender roles as a form of oppression which helped ignite second wave feminism. Um, it helped make us. It helped make. Uh, it helped make us as a country question gender roles and shake them up. Question and interrogate how men in power have enforced these strict gender roles and why and how it again sort of maintained this uh, again toxic power dynamic. Um, this helped push the 1963 Equal Pay Act, the budding pro-choice movement, and Frieden co-funded the National Organization of Women. So before I kind of show you the resources in a second, just keep that in mind. Keep in mind where we were in 1964 regarding um, second wave feminism, just coming up, right? Just coming through in 1963. And very much how this book, Better Mystique, brought to light the gender stereotype of the traditional housewife being perpetuated. And again, it, and I think it's very important to note, it's not, especially where we sort of learn now and sort of adapting this now, it's not attacking that necessarily, but what it is attacking is the idea that society forces a very strict, narrow, singular gender role for women at the time um, and how it's continued in certain ways in our culture in America. Um, and what second wave feminism, and I think what the Naked Kiss is exploring is to, again, the idea of shaking up those gender expectations, shaking up those gender norms. Um, okay, so now that we kind of set a foundation here, I have some resources that you can always check out if you wanna learn a little bit more. Um, so we built a historical context, again, just kind of setting the stage historically where we were at 19, early 1960s. Okay, um, rarely do I give information about the filmmaker, but I think it's important to give a little bit of information here. And I think it's also important to note, Sam Fuller is a male director, right? He's a male uh, writer director. But just a little bit of context, um, Samuel Fuller started as a journalist and then served in World War II. Uh, he served in the 1st Infantry Division for the U.S. Army, which you'll see a little reference to in the film. The Big Red One is um, sort of a nickname for this infantry unit. Uh, they saw heavy fighting and served in Tunisia, Sicily, and Normandy. He wrote a novel that was published while he was in service. He came back home to be a writer, then a screenwriter. Disappointed by the adaptations of his work, Fuller uh, decided to uh, guarantee that he would be a director on the films that he wrote. Uh, Fuller often utilized his journalistic integrity to investigate injustices in America via his films. And again, I think that's an important bullet point here. Um, especially for the time in classic era cinema, we weren't really seeing a lot of this. We weren't really seeing films place a spotlight on certain injustices. And bring to light things that needed to be changed. Um, and I think that's what you're gonna see here. Again, also this film being influenced by second wave feminism. Okay, uh, as always, I place a picture of our filmmaker. So this is Sam Fuller, writer director of The Naked Kiss, which was released in 1964. All right, so a little bit of information on the credits. 
and you're going to want to write some of this down. Again, you should have been taking notes all along. Um, but you want to definitely take notes on the cast, so the actors and the characters, uh, just so you have a little bit of context. So our credits, the film was written, directed, and produced by Samuel Fuller. The director of photography was Stanley Cortez. The cast is Constant Towers, who plays Kelly. Kelly is the protagonist of the film. Anthony Isley who plays Griff. Michael Dante, who plays Grant. And Virginia Gray, who plays Candy. Um, also, just a couple of notes here. Keep in mind, this was a low budget film. So it's maybe a little rough around the edges at certain parts on a formal level. Um, it was made for $200,000 and it was not shot on a pretty tight schedule. And just as a refresher, this is our film that's representative of the classic film era, right? Where it's, oddly enough, it's sort of right on the, the cusp, right? Right before we get into the new Hollywood, but it is 1964. So still within the classic film era. And just take note, just, you know, just to kind of Give you a heads up the editing speed might be a little slower than you're used to we might be holding on master shots for a little bit longer than you're used to before we cut into a scene or sometimes we don't cut into a scene at all there are a few sort of jarring edits um there's a couple of like odd jump cuts again there's it's just a little sometimes rough um and then some questionable acting and depictions all right so i'm going to read through our primer topics. And again, you should take some notes. You don't have to write every single thing down, um, but I'm just going to go over some of this. And you can always, when you're actually like writing up your discussion board, I linked these presentations on the discussion board. So if you want, you can just click it and refer back to this too. Um, but I'm going to read through it quickly. Okay. So again, the primary theory we're using here is the feminist film theory. But we're also using the social science theory, right? That's why I provided a very brief and uh, general overview of, again, where we were at in the early 1960s, again, right after second wave feminism. So as a reminder, this movie was released in 1964. Consider what is Fuller trying to address about America's systemic oppression of women and maintaining narrow gender roles. Again, the idea of this sort of being exposed is something pretty new for our culture. And think about how that's uh, influencing a director, a filmmaker here to now make a movie that carries this idea. Again, the idea of kind of shaking up uh, narrow gender roles. Um, and then using the feminist and humanist film theories, look out for symbolic characters. Kelly is our protagonist. and kind of track her arc in the film and also her will to act in several scenes. And again, how she sort of connects to this uh, main idea of shaking up gender roles at the time. Excuse me. And then we have other symbolic characters, including Griff. Griff is the detective in the film. Think about how Griff sort of serves as a representative of, of the patriarchy, this idea of a man in power who's kind of telling Kelly what to do and forcing certain things on her um, and has certain judgments on her. What is the film doing with these symbolic characters? And then you also have Buff and Grant. Some topics to explore in the film, um, topics and themes, depiction of sex work, especially for the time, hypocrisy of those in power, judgment, social influence, deconstruction of reverence, or kind of bringing down false idols in a way, um, enforcement of narrow gender roles, feeling obligated to follow gender roles, societal pressures. I use the term the third face. Uh, this was actually the title of Fuller's autobiography. And it's this idea that you have to kind of present different versions of yourself to different people. And it's usually in some way of um, um, hierarchy, right? The idea that you would present yourself maybe a little bit differently to your employer than you would to a family member. And that you would also uh, present yourself a little bit differently to a, from a, to a family member in comparison to like a close friend. So think about how, especially Kelly, uh, feels obligated to sort of 
tweak her personnel and behavior uh, depending on who she's interacting with and the reason why. Um, the idea of breaking gender roles, again, shaking up narrow gender roles, the theme of personal fulfillment versus societal influence. So doing what you want versus what society is kind of pushing you to do. And then patriarchy as a structural force. This is a big one. I don't want to spoil anything. Uh, but again, I would kind of take note of Griff and Grant as symbols of this. And again, without spoiling anything, there are a few key shots towards the final scene of the film. And think about how those shots maybe communicate this. Um, and there's a symbol in literally the last shot of the film. Okay, humanist. Um, humanist on a semiotic level. We have some motifs, and these two motifs are songs. Uh, one is the Moonlight Sonata. You're going to hear it a few times. Consider uh, some characters actually kind of talk about what the Moonlight Sonata means to them. So think about that. Listen to some lines of dialogue there. Um, but then also maybe when you hear it the last time, how its impact changes a little bit. And then there's another song in the film that doesn't really have a title, but we're just going to call it the children's song. And it's uh, it plays a, in a few pivotal scenes. Um, one time it's died. Well, actually, both times it's diegetic, I believe. Um, Pay attention to a couple of the lyrics in the song. I quoted one here, tell me why can't I fly? Don't wander too far for what you really seek is right here where you are. Without spoiling anything, you can maybe see how that's starting to link to our sort of um, primary question up top. I'm using my little spotlight tool. All right again, this is sort of our uh, base to work off of. How is this film um, sort of exploring second wave feminism and taking on it's um, sort of act of protest to expose these intricacies of injustice. Um, so again, the children's song, pay attention to lyrics, pay attention to when it reoccurs in the narrative, when you hear it again, this time it's now playing off a recording and how maybe this time it's being played recontextualizes the song. Uh, you have key symbols, the wedding dress, a newspaper headline, remember Sam Fuller comes from a journalistic background and I think he utilizes a headline. I'm not spoiling what the space is, but the sort of idea of like a sensationalized headline and again, placing a character into a very sort of singular gender role, placing a label on her. Um, and again, consider what that sort of links to and a symbolic character of Charlie. Charlie's not a living character. That's all I'll say about that. Um, humanist film theory. So we have formal encoding. The big one for this movie is dialogue. Sam Fuller is a writer first and foremost. Um, so I have a bunch of lines quoted here. I'm not gonna read them all, um, but keep an ear out for key lines of dialogue that link to thematic exposition. Right, lines of dialogue that are linking to the topics and themes that we explored up top here. Um, I'll just quote a couple, okay? Uh, you'll meet men that you live on and men that live on you, and that's the only kind of men you'll meet. Uh, nothing is more terrible than active ignorance. You had nothing to do with it, nothing. It was your mirror. Uh, I took a look at my life. I kind of uh, paraphrase that last one. Um, and I'm quoting it too verbatim, but essentially that line of dialogue kind of talks about how maybe one character is saying they're responsible for someone's change, while another character is saying it had nothing to do with you, it had to do with me sort of doing some self-reflection. Um, then look out for a few key scenes. The opening scene of the film, literally the opening shots of the film, is very sort of confrontational, and it's something you didn't really see in, at this time. And that's one thing. And you're going to see a little bit of character building and Kelly's will to act. But think about on a meta level, what are you seeing? Uh, without spoiling anything, all I'll say is you see a character literally fighting the camera, literally attacking the camera. That's the first shot of the movie you see. Um, think about what's being said there. 
Um, and then also sort of linking to uh, social science theory and feminist film theory, consider the depiction of a female character in the classic era. The, again, the idea of a cinematic gender coding and how Kelly, even if you haven't seen a lot of classic era films, you can probably see how um, Kelly's character is sort of fighting um, off cinematic coding at that time, breaking away from it. Um, and again, I think that's kind of linked in those opening shots. And then there's another key scene. That, I mean, there's plenty of key scenes, right? These are just examples for you to kind of look out for. Um, but for me, a, another crucial scene is a scene between Kelly and Buff. Um, and without spoiling anything, Sam Fuller kind of places the entire scene in a two shot where Buff is in the foreground and Kelly is in the background. And once you see that composition start, notice that it's a long take. We don't cut. It's about a two minute long take. Excuse me. Pay attention to how the foreground is sort of changing. So to be more specific, Buff's facial reactions are changing based on what Kelly is saying. And you might also want to jot down a few notes of dialogue. Um, Kelly basically has like a monologue in this scene. And clearly Fuller wants us to pay attention to it, placing it in that setup and then also not cutting, right? We hold on that shot for two minutes. Think about why. And again, I think a lot of it is in the dialogue. So you might want to jot down a few uh, quotes there. Okay, I'm out of breath as I ran through this as quickly as I could while still trying to make this clear. So um, to be very clear, if you're good to go, go ahead, go to Canopy, watch the naked kiss. And then when you're done, go back to the discussion board, write up at least four sentences of your interpretation of the film. This is just sort of a launching pad, okay? These primer topics in the presentation to give you some sort of perspective into the movie. But you can take your interpretation in a different direction if you'd like to. Or you can literally answer one of these questions or interpret one of these lines of dialogue um, while still using some evidence from the film to reinforce that. If you're not confident with that yet, then stick around and I'll walk you through the process one more time. I'm only going to do it for this one, okay? So Punch Discussion 2, which is Lahane, and Punch Discussion 3, which is uh, Leave No Trace, I'm not going to do it for this, okay? You sh you're going to know by then that you come to the lecture recording, you listen and watch through the presentation. Then when I say, okay, that's it, go ahead and watch Lahane. Go ahead and watch Leave No Trace. Then leave your post on the discussion board. You should know what to do by then. Okay, well, we're going to do sort of a recap today. So I'm going to pretend that I'm a student. Okay, I checked in. I'm all done. Now I'm uh, exiting off the lecture recording. I'm going to go back to our Canvas page. And I'm just going to double check. Okay, yep, I'm in. Uh, whoops, I should probably share the screen. Uh, I'm on our Canvas page. And I see 13 Punch Discussion 1, Naked Kiss. The video that obviously isn't there right now, but you just saw it, right? It was in here. There's the punch discussion. There's the message board. Now, before I do that, I need to actually watch the movie. So to watch the movie, I'm going to go to Canopy. Again, you should be registered by now. If you are not, if you didn't do it, don't worry. Just go back to our modules. Go up to the very top. I have the Canopy walkthrough video. This will walk you through step-by-step -step on how to register. And then this is the Canopy website. So once you're registered and you have your login, you go to Canopy. I'm already logged in. I'm gonna go ahead and hide this, okay? So I'm in Canopy, right? I'm already logged in. And now I'm just gonna search for the film. Go up to the search bar, type in the naked kiss. There we go. The Naked Kiss, click. It's gonna bring me to the page for the film. And you might not see this. Sometimes Canopy doesn't um, show this when I'm trying to uh, share the screen. But right now, excuse me, you should see the player for the video and the play button. If you just hit play, load up. It left off. I'll play from the beginning for you. 
Okay. Now, right now, again, you're probably not seeing anything, but it's playing in my browser and you can choose full screen right here. Okay. Also, this is going to be important for um, Lahane, which I have a separate slide for when we get there, so don't worry about it. But if you ever want to have uh, subtitles on, go ahead and hit subtitles, CC English or captions off. Okay. Also, just a quick note, do not watch any of the movies in fast forward. Please don't do that. Again, you still need to use some filmic evidence with your interpretation. Okay, so again, I'm pretending I'm the student. Um, I watched the film, I took notes. Okay, I think I'm ready to go ahead and do my discussion board. So I'm gonna go back to our Canvas page and I'm just gonna go to the module, module 13, Naked Kiss. There's the presentation. The lecture recording was above that. Here's the punch discussion, click. It's gonna bring me right to the assignment, okay? Um, I provide you the primer presentation if you wanna check in back on those notes. If you're ready to go, go to the uh, discussion board, hit reply, then type up your post and hit post reply. And that's it. Okay, and again, that is due November 10th by 11.59 p.m. All right, so that's it. Again, I tried to kind of make this fast. Um, good luck, I look forward to reading your interpretation. I hope you enjoy the film. I will see you next module.